Welcome everybody, and thank you for joining Geoscience Australia's Wednesday seminar series um, this morning. My name is Marcus Haynes. I'm a geophysicist here in the Mineral Systems Branch of the Mineral Energy and Groundwater Division at Geoscience Australia. Before we get underway, first and foremost, I would like to make an acknowledgement of country. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures, the elders past and present. I'm excited to be able to introduce this morning's speaker, Dr. Alison Kirkby and her presentation, Lithospheric Conductors Reveal Source Regions of Convergent Margin Mineral Systems. The clean energy transition will require a vast increase in metal supply, yet discoveries of new metals, uh, metal deposits are declining. Recently, several case studies have demonstrated links between electrical conductors imaged using magnetotelluric or MT data and mineral deposits. The use of MT methods for exploration is therefore growing, but the general applicability has not yet been tested. Alison and her collaborators have looked at the spatial relationships between conductors and three deposit styles and found that uh, volcanic hosted massive sulfide and copper porphyry deposits show weak to moderate correlations with conductors in the upper mantle. In contrast, Orogenic gold deposits show strong correlations with mid-crustal conductors. These differences likely reflect differences in the way these deposits have formed and suggest a metamorphic fluid source for orogenic gold is significant. The resistivity uh, signature can be preserved for hundreds uh, of millions of years and therefore MT can be a powerful tool for mineral exploration. A little bit about uh, our presenter. Alison Kirkby completed her MSc at the University of Auckland in 2008, uh, then joined Geoscience Australia in the same year. She worked in Geoscience Australia's geothermal team in 2013 before um, completing her PhD uh, in geophysics at the University of Adelaide in 2016. Alison returned to Geoscience Australia's magnetotelluric team, where she worked on imaging Australia's lithosphere with a focus on mineral systems. In 2021, she crossed the ditch uh, back home to join GNS Science in Topo, New Zealand, where she has been applying geophysical methods to exploration, characterization, and monitoring of New Zealand's geothermal resources. As we welcome Alison to present, uh, just a reminder to, to, to the audience that you can post your questions in the chat as the presentation is going along. So welcome, Alison. Hi, so I'm going to be talking to you today about some work uh, that I was working on at GA um, and it was looking at the correlation between um, conductors uh, identified by magnetotelluric models and um, mineral systems. Um, and I thought I'd include a little picture of an actively forming convergent mar margin mineral system um, as a shout out to my current hometown. So before I start, um, I guess I'll give you a bit of background um, about why we're doing this. Um, so the demand for mineral system uh, for minerals is uh, going to grow. Um, firstly through population pressure and ongoing development, but also if we'd like to meet climate change goals, we need to be able to find more minerals. Um, the left-hand graph that you can see um, shows uh, some scenarios put out um, by the World Bank um, in their report on minerals for climate action. Uh, the most conservative scenario um, in the green line assumes that uh, all countries will meet their Paris Agreement obligations. Um, and the other two scenarios are um, limiting climate change by 1.75 or 2 degrees by 2100. 
um, and it shows the total demand for the metals uh, shown in the in the table on the right, um, which um, is coded by different different energy technologies. Um, and so, I guess regardless of whether uh, you know we need more minerals um, anyway due to population pressure, the the drive to um, act on climate change is also going to have a significant impact and. Um, we're going to need between double and four and a half times uh, the amount of metals uh, that we do now um, but, um, by 2050. Uh, and so, um, and that's not even taking into account changes to the transport sector. So that's just energy um, production. So I guess G um, Australia is really well placed to help meet that demand. Um, Australia is a very important player on the global stage in terms of um, exploration expenditure and also production. Um, it's also very important to Australia's economy. 10% um, of GDP um, and significant con contributions to um, both employment and exports. And so most of well, the, my GA colleagues would know um, about this, this Exploring for the Future program, which started in um, 2016. Uh, to support a strong economy, resilient society and sustainable environment for the benefit of Australians through um, understanding our mineral energy and groundwater potential. Um, and that program uh, involves a range of different activities, um, new data and software to support, um, support decision making um, and to support exploration, um, as well as uh, improved geological understanding um, and improved understandings of um, mineral systems and resource potential. And the idea is that that will lead to outputs, which will then um, produce um, outcomes such as increased investment in Australia and hopefully new mineral discoveries. Um, and so the work that I'm gonna be showing here um, is falls into the sort of mineral systems resource potential area. And so, I like showing this this figure. Um, I know a lot of you have seen it uh, many times before, but it kind of helps to, um, I guess, introduce why um, why we're looking at magnetic lyrics. Um, so the idea that MT can be used to um, explore for mineral systems is a kind of a concept that's evolved over the last couple of decades. Um, 2006, uh, Graham Heinsen and others identified there was a a uh, lower crustal conductive anomaly beneath the Olympic Dam deposit in South Australia. Um, and then subsequent work over the next decade um, identified that um, there are actually conductive pathways that lead up to some of the well-known uh, mineral, uh, mineral deposits in the area. And so that provided, has provided a lot of um, and that and, and subsequent um, examples that have, have come out since then show have, have provided impetus for the OSLAMP program. Um, and the OSLAMP program is really targeted targeted at finding these things, these really big conductors. Um, so so we've, you know, using OSLAMP can identify these really big conductors and then subsequent infill work can then identify where those go towards the surface. So the Australian Lithospheric Architecture Magnetotelluric program is a collaboration between um, Geoscience Australia and some Australian universities and state surveys. Um, and we're there over a third complete now. Um, so completing um, what will be a three, um, nearly 3,000 or around 3,000 sites every half a degree. Geoscience Australia has had quite a strong contribution to that. Um, in Northern, Northern Australia under Exploring for the Future, uh, in Southeast Australia uh, in collaboration with the state surveys um, and also uh, uh, logistical support uh, for other state programs. Um, so in, in South Australia and Tasmania. And yeah, and so that's producing, starting to produce uh, some really interesting, really cool models. Uh, so the background image um, here was based on um, was a, a low resolution conductivity map um, of Australia based on Australian um, geomagnetic, uh, Australian wide um, geomagnetic, geomagnetic stations. <laughs> Got that out in the end. Um, 
and it is um, kind, of, kind of gives you a broad um, view of the conductivity structure, but you can really see um, the OSLAMP models, which, um, which are shown over the top, uh, providing uh, significantly increased resolution. And one thing that stands out is that in a lot of regions, there's a correlation between um, the conductors identified from these MT models and um, mineral deposits shown in the stars. And so what this work, what I'd try, like to try and address with this work is um, what do these minerals, uh, what do these relationships actually tell us about different mineral systems? Um, is it different for the different mineral systems? Um, and can we and how would we translate resistivity into mineral prospectivity? Um, and so the way I guess that you would bring MT into a mineral prospectivity analysis is based on a mineral systems approach, um, which is the idea that you know, deposits don't form randomly. They form um, there's you know, a range of different processes that lead to the lead to the formation of mineral de um, deposits. So starting with um, enrichment um, in the lower crust or, or in the um, mantle, uh, and then that's you know, driven by some sort of driver to the surface through crustal pathways, so fluid, um, fractures and faults. And then at the surface, there's some mechanism to concentrate um, the concentrate the ore um, and form a deposit. And so the idea is that um, you know, we can use geoscientific data sets um, that form proxies for each of these different processes. Um, and what we'd like to do is bring MT in. Um, so what proxies can, what, what components does this actually map? Um, this work builds on some work that was done um, a couple of years ago now, um, looking at the um, relationship of deposits to the lithosphere stenosphere boundary and the finding that 85% um, of sediment hosted base metal deposits occur within 200 kilometers of the um, that transition between thick and thin lithosphere. Um, so I'll be looking at this, this is a similar sort of style of approach, I guess. Um, so the three deposit types that I've focused on, or we've focused on, um, uh, they're, they're convergent margin mineral systems. Um, and so a con convergent margins sort of have three phases of development and each phase has some different mineral systems that form. Um, so starting with subduction, um, get uh, quite a lot of calcalkaline, porphyry, copper, gold deposits. Um, and in these ones, the, um, the fluids or the source are kind of in the mantle wedge beneath um, the crust and also in the lower, lower crustal region. Also get VHMS deposits forming as well. Uh, the next phase is orogenesis. Um, that's when you get orogenic gold deposits. And there's actually like a couple of competing ideas um, as to where the source location is for orogenic gold deposits. Um, oh, there we go. Um, the first idea is uh, the lithospheric mantle. Um, so some, some people think that the fluids are sourced there. Um, and the alternative is um, in the in the um, mid, mid to lower crust, so um, for, through metamorphic devolatization of um, of rocks in, in that region. So we're hoping that through this work we can hopefully say something about you know which one might which model might be more or less likely. Um, and then finally, you get post subduction um, post orogenic extension. Um, and you get uh, alkaline, porphyry, copper, gold deposits, and additional VHMS deposits. Also, some intrusion-related deposits. So the area that um, I'm going to be showing you first is in southeast Australia, um, and it is a it is um, the site of the Lachlan and Dalmarian origins, um, which formed uh, between 520 and 380 EMA and rich in gold and copper deposits of various styles, but um, dominantly um, porphyry copper, BHMS and orogenic gold, which I just discussed. And so I um, was involved in modeling the OSLAMP data through, um, through that area. Um, and I guess perhaps unsurprisingly, there appeared to be a visual correlation between 
um, conductors on the lower crust and gold deposits. Um, and so one of the some of the questions that I had coming out of that was, um, is it statistically significant? Um, there looks to be a correlation, but there's all this area that's covered in white, that's um, this white sedimentary basins, um, and there's been no discoveries there. Um, so is there actually a correlation there? Is it a significant correlation? Um, and then also what I was interested in is um, which depths have the best correlation and does it matter which mineral system um, in terms of you know the correlation, the best correlation and the depth. So the method, um, oh, this, this sort of slide describes the method. Um, so this is another um, uh, another view of the depth slice at 37 kilometres, um, and I've shown the 100 ohm metre contour. So the grey area is within the contour and transparent outside. And sedimentary basin cover is shown in pale yellow, and orogenic gold deposits are scaled by size, and they're shown um, in the yellow dots. So for each deposit, uh, you calculate the shortest horizontal distance between the deposit and the contour. So if it's within the contour, it's a negative distance, and if it's outside the contour, it's a positive distance. And you can put that up on a cumulative distribution plot. Um, and from that, you can sort of find, pick out in interesting stats, um, like 90% of orogenic gold deposits are located within 26 kilometres of the 100 ohm metre contour. Um, but I guess that's kind of, it's not all that meaningful um, because what you really want to know is like how significant is that? Um, and so you can do the same uh, for random locations. So that's that's what I've done is seeded some random locations across the onshore uncovered area. So this white area. The reason why um, we exclude the sedimentary basin covered area is not because we don't think there are deposits there, but because we don't have any deposit data there. Um, so it's to make it a fair statistical test, we just look at un uncovered areas. And you can do that lots of times. So you end up with a range of, um, of cumulative distributions um, for random, and then you can compare. So 65% um, of random locations are located within 100 ohm meters, uh, with, with, within 26 kilometers of the 100 ohm meter contour. So um, that D value is kind of the distance between, um, or the difference between deposits um, and random. And it's really interesting because we have, um, we can sort of use it to look at the correlation as a function of depth in the resistivity model. Um, and so for each depth slice in the resistivity model, you can produce one of these plots and show it in color as a function of depth. So the horizontal axis on this plot is the same between the two, but instead D is now colored um, and we're showing as, as a function of depth in the resistivity model. So these regions where you have um, red values, that we've got high values of D, and the yellow regions, we've got lower values. You can also pick out the maximum D value at each, um, um, at each uh, cumulative distribution, and that's the black line here. So then we can pick out some peaks. So these are peaks where we've got the best association between conductors and um, the conductor, uh, conductors and mineral deposits or origin gold deposits. You can do the same with the other deposit types, so porphyry copper um, and the HMS. And I've also shown um, the MOHO, which is the, the grey band here, the semi-transparent band. I've picked out the depths directly beneath each deposit that's used in the analysis. Um, and so we can see that for origin of gold, we're in the mid to lower crust. For porphyry copper, there's a peak kind of near the surface, which is probably a bit of an artifact given the resolution of the Auslamp model and also in the lower crust. Um, and then in VHMS, we see uh, a lithospheric mantle peak. So um, that's all really interesting. We're seeing some really significant and you know, notable differences between the, two, the different deposit types. But I guess the next question is, well, like how significant is this correlation? 
So we can apply um, what's called a Kolmogorov Smirnoff statistical test. Um, and it uses that D value and also the size of the deposit data set population. Um, and it gives you the probability that a given D value could occur accidentally if the two cumulative distributions, so the, the deposit population and the random population, have been drawn from the same population, basically. Um, and so if it's if it's high, then there's a good chance that it could have been drawn from random. If it's low, then it's an um, it's a low chance. So basically a low PKS indicates a stronger correlation between deposits and conductors. And the lower the the lower the value, the kind of better the strength of the correlation, essentially. Um, and so higher D and the larger deposit populations reduce the P, the, that probability. And so we can put those on the plots now. So I've just picked out um, the D value at the peaks. Um, so for origin at gold, we've got a peak here in the in the lower in the mid to lower crust, and it's um, a very very low value. So six by ten to the minus nine. So we're pretty confident in that result there. Porphyry copper, on the other hand, um, PKS is point um, zero six, so six about a six percent chance that that could have been pulled from random. Um, so moderately high in the case of porphyry copper. BHMS, it's kind of intermediate. We've got about a 1% chance. Um, so it's not particularly high, but it's um, it's not really high, but it's not particularly low either. Um, and so once I came up with those results, I guess um, one of the first questions I was asked as well, um, you know, how sensitive are these results to the choices that we made in terms of the data sets and um, what thresholds we applied on the data sets? Um, and so um, one of the questions was, well, what if we look at only the large deposits? Or what if we you know, include lots of them? We could include the really small ones. So I run the analysis using different subsets of the deposit data set, um, excluding um, first um, um, all, all deposits greater than 0.1 tonnes, all the really, really small ones, uh, greater than one tonne, which is in the main analysis, and greater than 10 tonnes. And any bigger than that, um, we start to lose significance because remembering that, you know, we need a moderate, reasonable size of the, of the population to be able to actually get some statistics out. And you can see when you use the different, um, you use a different cutoff um, size, uh, it makes, little difference to the results. So the, the P, that PKS value um, gets higher as you reduce the number of deposits and you, um, but it, you know, might not, doesn't really necessarily make much difference to D. Um, but in terms of the actual um, patterns that we see, um, there's not a lot of difference. Um, second question um, that I get asked, well, what if we choose a different resistivity contour? We use the 100 ohm meter, one of, you know, what if we use a different one? Um, so I ran it using some different resistivity contours. Um, and again, we can see, you know, pretty similar results between um, the different contours. So it doesn't seem to make a lot of that much difference. The other thing that um, I guess I was concerned about when I got the results out was, well, MT ver inversions have a lot of uncertainty um, and the parameters that you choose in the inversion can um, change where anomalies pop up in the inversion, um, particularly anomalies that, you know, aren't all that sensitive to, you know, some of them, will, some, some of the smaller ones um, aren't all that well constrained. So what if we chose different inversion parameters? So I run the analysis on 16 other models um, that um, I used when I was doing the Auslamp New South Wales modelling, New South Wales and Victoria modelling. Um, and they have different smoothing parameters, uh, different error flaws, different meshes. And I also ran um, models with a subset of stations. So taking 25% of stations out randomly um, four times. And I've put them, I've tried to put them all on one page. Um, and you can see that um, there's uh, very, li very little difference. So we still get the same sorts of patterns um, for all of the different inversion models. So we're pretty convinced um, that in Southeast Australia, we're seeing like fairly robust kind of patterns um, and differences between the different deposit types. Um, 
the next question is, well, is this something that's peculiar to Southeast Australia? Is this something that just occurs in Southeast Australian deposits and, and, and resistivities? Or is this something that's kind of more widespread? Does it have a general applicability? And so um, we all then went scouring the literature looking for resistivity models that were available um, from UMT. Um, got quite a few of them from the Oz Array program and um, uh, not Oz Array, US Array um, program. So there's quite a few models that are available there um, and then a, a smattering of um, others from across the world. Um, and we combined them all together into um, all, all together into one lot and ran the analysis again. So Southeast Australia is that right hand panel that I showed before. So you see that pattern for orogenic gold, uh, porphyry copper and BHMS. Um, and then really interestingly, if you look at the outside Australia deposits, so that's excluding the South Australia data set, including everything else, similar relationship for orogenic gold, lower crust, mid to lower crust, and it's a bit of a um, atmospheric mantle peak as well. Porphyry copper um, shows a different relationship. So if you look at the outside Australia data, it's actually a fairly strong correlation um, with um, with mantle conductors. Um, and that's kind of what you'd expect given what we know about formation of porphyry copper deposits. So the Australian one is sort of a bit of a surprise really. Um, and then when you combine it globally, we sort of see a similar pattern. Um, so similar pattern to the outside Australia for porphyry copper. VHMS, um, not such a convincing result for the outside Australia data set and for the global data sets. So not really any strong peaks in those data sets. Um, so I guess the question is why? Um, so for orogenic gold, um, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, there's this lack of consensus on the metal or fluid source for orogenic gold deposits. Um, and based on our results, we'd think that probably a, a mid to lower crust um, source is more likely, um, given that we see that strong correlation between resistivity models, uh, between conductors um, in the mid to lower crust and deposits. Porphyry copper, as I sort of uh, mentioned earlier, um, these are these form these are quite often in um, te tectonically active settings, um, and I guess um, if you look at um, the ages of the deposits with the global data set they're actually all quite young and that partly reflects preservation bias so like the old ones often just get um, get taken away get eroded um, and so a lot of the deposits are in sort of areas that are still pretty active and so Perhaps um, you know in tectonically active settings, this correlation simply reflects you know fluids and mounts associated with the system that the, the deposits located in. But even in fossil systems, you, you'd expect um, metasodomatized mantle and sulfides um, to be forming beneath the deposits, um, and so you'd also expect correlation. Um, question is why are the Australian systems different? Um, Partly, possibly due to the age, they're significantly older. So this is orange, showing um, this shown in orange. Um, but also, in Australia, there are um, some of the deposits are alkaline deposits, uh, which perform, which form in sub uh, post subduction um, extension. And so, um, perhaps maybe there's um, fluids coming up and scavenging and scavenging out all of the conductive material um, to form, form the deposit. I'm not sure, um, but um, those are some of the ideas as to why we see such a different um, signal in the, the Australian deposits. VHMS um, are known to be shallow systems, um, and so it's not really surprising that we have a weak correlation, um, but the fact that we do have a little bit of a correlation is somewhat surprising. Um, some ideas as to why that is, um, possibly a slight mantle component um, to the deposits. Um, my idea was, well, maybe they're just, because they're just located to, they're all located close to path, crustal pathways. Um, so maybe it's just an associated association between um, 
you know, breaks in the lithosphere or, or crustal, crustal boundaries and deposits that we're seeing here, and not specifically the deposits themselves. Um, so in summary, in terms of the results, um, we see very strong correlation between orogenic gold and mid-crust conductors, um, consistent with uh, the metals being sourced in the mid-crust. Um, the porphyry copper and copper gold deposits is associated with um, mantle conductors, um, which is likely reflecting the deep plumbing systems between beneath these deposits. Um, and VHMS deposits show a weak association with the lithospheric mantle conductors, um, which is kind of consistent with the shallow hydrothermal circulation associated with these systems. So in terms of what's next, um, well, I've got a few ideas. Um, the I guess it would be really nice to um, expand to other models across the globe. So try some different models um, as they come out um, and te test other mineral system types um, and also apply the approach with other data sets um, and model results. So different different types of geophysical data sets, for example. Um, and so the I guess the everything that you'd need to sort of repeat this analysis and, and try it on a different data set is available. So uh, the code's available, um, you can go and download it. Uh, the deposit data is available with the paper um, and the models, all of the models that we um, we used are publicly available models as well. So, um, you know, if you're interested, you can go along and, and try it out. Um, and I guess the next thing, um, with what's next is um, trying to actually use this information to bring MT into these mineral systems assessments. So, for example, for orogenic gold, it seems seems like something like the 26 kilometer or the the mid to, uh, one of the mid to lower crustal depth slices would be a good depth slice to bring into mineral systems uh, into a into an assessment for orogenic gold. Um, and you know, for other deposits, it would be a different depth slice. Um, but I guess um, what needs to be done is um, somehow convert these MT models into some sort of probability um, or um, prospectivity kind of measure. Um, there's been a little bit of work done at GA since um, since I finished this work. Um, so there was a graduation, uh, gradu graduate rotation done to further develop the codes um, and apply it to magnetite alteration um, based on the modeling of um, James Goodwin, Richard Lay, right, Lane. Um, and that, but I guess, um, you know, the usefulness of the method is it um, allows quick testing of the strength of spatial relationships. So you can refine the translation um, between a particular geophysical parameter that's defined to a ma mappable proxy. Um, and I guess there's work ongoing towards an integrated toolkit that can inform and enable the construction of mineral potential assessment layers. And that's all I've got. Um, these are just the partners in Auslamp and um, yeah, that's it. And I've got the link to the paper at the bottom there. So thank you. Thank you, Alison. That's a, a fantastic talk. Um, you know, among, among other activities, Geoscience Australia has a number of these sort of continental scale geophysical data acquisition projects like OSLAMP that are allowing us to image the characteristics of the Earth um, in a sense that hasn't been previously available to us. And the work that you've presented is, is a wonderful example of, of being able to use these to generate novel insights. And I think the great thing about your work is that is that we get both. We get process understanding and a deeply practical tool for refining our understanding of mineral prospectivity. So uh, I commend you on a, a fantastic project and on your leadership in this space as well. Thank you.